I I, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to come on and talk. Of course, no problem. All right. Well, I uh, I have a lot of um, I had a lot of Eastern tendencies in my philosophy for a long time, and that's kind of how I came to Christianity was through that route. And coming to your video series what was like a combination of the two for me, and. It had a lot of it was very insightful and it connected the dots that were absent for me for for most of the Christian doctrine. And so for that, I have a lot of gratitude towards your efforts. And so many people probably don't know what your um, primary fo focus is with your work. But I was going to ask you um, if you could. Uh, is there a way that you could break down kind of what what your objective is and how you came into these insights that that you've that you've kind of relayed in your books and YouTube? Um, I guess my main objective is to share the deeper meanings of spiritual texts, uh, mainly because of my upbringing, um, the Bible, but um, I do always explore um, other cultural uh, spiritual texts as well and unpack those and sometimes use them to quantify biblical translations or sometimes just unpack those um in their own sense uh, but there's so many parallels to be drawn that's really what fascinated me and kind of unleashed my own um understanding and gnosis to new levels of being able to feel really free and really able to express myself and eventually what brought on my um, Kundalini awakening, although I didn't know it was a Kundalini awakening at the time, I, at the time that it happened, I understood it as the anointing of Christ. So that's intriguing for those that may not know kundalini from my from my understanding is the eastern conception of an awakening that produces kind of an energy that's been dormant or something like that and experiencing something like that without knowing exactly what kundalini is first offhand it's a very odd experience i think for most people and it, did you see any parallels between how they conceptualize kundalini and what the bible speaks of as the baptism of the holy spirit um, for sure, there's there's really obvious numerical parallels. For example, the 144,000 that is spoken of in the Bible book of Revelation um, is also the sum total of the Nadis that are given in Eastern texts and also further parallels with the DNA genes in our light bodies. Um, so, yeah, when we're talking about Kundalini, we're talking about um, a connecting or a reconnecting of our inner circuit. And again there are parallels in the bible that talk about this reconnection this marriage wedding alchemical wedding divine wedding or welding if you like yeah. of that so once the circuit is complete that's you know when you experience that kind of um awakening as as we call it nowadays yeah, yeah. And in the, in, in the Eastern side of things, a lot of times they it seemed to me that it was a very disciplined practice to try to achieve such an awakening. And then there's some that just kind of have it randomly occur, and then have a kind of a disorientation towards it, because they have it's really unknown to them, at least from what I've kind of read. And so Kundalini, finding the Bible was a nice way to put it into a story, at least to understand the purpose and the, and the resources of it. So I think that's really interesting. But Additionally, your video, of course, that got that got my attention off the bat was that was the one that was about the sacred secretion. And mm -hmm. I I wanted to particularly ask you about as broad as that topic is, I wanted to particularly ask you about that in particular. And what brought you to the conclusion of that? Um, is Did you did you have an experience or something, something of that nature that led you to this um, insight or and then you found the Bible afterwards or or how did you come about that? Yeah, I had, um, I was in a, a kind of frustrated place in life and um, I was just going really hard um, at 
my then Christian practices, just really listening to every word that I was being taught and really trying to put it into a practical sense in my life. And I've always been a vivid dreamer and I was getting um, the scripture, Matthew 6, 33, coming through a lot, which is seek you first and all else shall be added unto you. And I felt really intrigued of like, you know, what could I, what could be added? Could I, could some healing take place? Could I begin to feel better and more and come back into a more optimistic place? Mm -hmm. Um, so, and that was really my drive, you know, to feel well, to to overcome some some fog and some things that were really weighing on me. Mm -hmm. um, and the culmination of all of that led me down like a few different paths. And one of them was the finding of the Essenes, which, uh, as you probably know, the primitive Christians, if you like, uh, the immovable light race, and they had their own yoga studies. Um, so I began my own yoga practice began to evolve into this more ancient practice where I was utilizing um, mantras and prayer and a lot of breath work in with my yoga so I was inadvertently doing a bit of kundalini without really realizing it yeah. um and eventually um my dreams and my visions were becoming much clearer and I saw a blank youtube channel and I thought gosh I don't know if I would ever share these types of things they're quite personal and private to me I'm not sure if anybody really cares or wants to know um but I was open to the promptings of of spirit um you know as I call it still and um yeah one night I just it was a very I had done yoga that morning and I was fasting and all of these things um but to no specific end other than this was the path that I felt that I should be on. Um, and yeah, one night when I went up to bed, I sat on the edge of the bed and it was one second, everything was totally normal. And then the next minute, I just felt like these penetrations of what felt like hot oil or vibrations just rising up my spine and the back of my head was just tingling and I mean to be honest it felt absolutely wonderful and there are gurus who talk about specifically not sharing your experiences mm -hmm. because of how the ego yeah. can get involved and all of these things so you know it is quite hard to because you want to share it because you want other people to have that that same mm -hmm. gift that same kind of purifying moment where everything seems to just make sense and yeah. everything becomes more clear and more beautiful literally you know in the blink of an eye yeah. um but there weren't that many people especially in my life back then that I could talk to about it so I was just kind of left like yeah thinking oh my gosh this was absolutely incredible I feel so blessed thank you god thank you god thank you god um and then just went on a real hardcore researching yeah. and yeah. um you know figuring out of what happened and I'd already in my dreams had several visions relating to the book of revelations to do with uh, the colors of the rainbow and chakras and things like that um, and because of my interest in yoga, um, I was seeing parallels between the texts, but the sacred secretion, I didn't actually fully make the complete connection until I saw um, the video that Jim Carrey of Jim oh. Carrey with mm -hmm. Norm MacDonald yeah. um, that John St. Julian shared mm -hmm. and in that moment I was like oh gosh like of course this is what happened this is this is it I finally know thank goodness um and everything else that I've that I've done all the videos and books that I've shared yeah. have all you know been a kind of off the back of 
of those revelations. Wow, that is that is super that's super neat. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, and I know I understand what you're saying about the di- like the dichotomy of keeping it in or sharing it outwardly because you never know how it's going to be approached by others if they're going to antagonize it or if they're going to call it her- heresy or something along those lines. And so it kind of it becomes like an internal debate. Do you want to share this? Is it right to do that? Or and uh, I think most certainly the work you've done and you've shared has been it's been unlike any other work that I've come across just because of how uniquely it does pair that Eastern thought. Um, but concerning, concerning the Kundalini and the vi- and, and having revelations like that, that give you that feeling um, of bliss, the maintenance of those co- becomes an issue at some point, at least for myself, like keeping that same vigor or energy or, or intense approach to it. And I think, do you think that potentially writing and expressing it, basically formulates your ideas kind of for you because if you keep it all in and instead of getting input and writing it down it's like you never really have all the pieces of the puzzle put together yeah definitely um you know writing uh especially the god design was such a big um undertaking for me at the time and I, I wasn't it wasn't like I was writing it specifically that I knew I was going to share it. It was more of like, well, I've got all of these puzzle pieces and I'm still fitting them into place. And oh my gosh, this is a beautiful tapestry. And then it was like, oh my gosh, like I have to share this because if, if one person could get what I've got from this, then, you know, that's something. And, you know, I would be very grateful for that. So I'm really humbled that it's, you know, reached a fair, like a good amount of people by this point. Um, But it's all been a very um, just organic kind of following the the breadcrumbs. And I know what you mean about the maintenance um, and about the sharing. Another thing about the sharing is that um, in certain circles, um you sort of begin to get the impression that people think that you think that you're better than them in some way because you've had this experience and obviously you know like it's not like that at no. all yeah. I don't feel superior to anyone or anything I'm grateful for the knowing and the understanding of unity between all of us and want us to all be able to raise each other up and then with the maintenance and the full understanding of the process and the grounding and protection of your energy um, and how that really comes into play at being really vigilant um, at taking care of yourself on a, on a really deep soul level um, you know becomes so important to you yeah um, but it's it is hard, especially you know it's it's one thing or another in our in the world that we live in today. It's oh somebody wants us to go out for their birthday. Oh now it's Christmas. Oh now it's Easter. Everyone's eating chocolate. Like it's it's very uh, the commercial and societal world is very geared towards us not particularly having the time to withdraw. And kind of do our wilderness exercises, if you like. That's a good way of saying it. I I think so as well. I think I think it's and especially in the U.S. and I assume maybe in the U.K. There's it's very prevalent that materialism is just accepted as as the primary ontology of being. And so there's no question as to why do we have sense perception and why do we have self consciousness. And coming to the realization that's as simple as that, like you said, it certainly doesn't put you on a pedestal by any means. You're, we're look, you're looking at the very basic elements of being and you're and you're spending and the people that do that are spending hours just trying to figure out why they can see the color red. It's not like they're trying to uh, take over the world <laughs> for some weird like um, vain sense. And uh, it reminds me of this St. Maximus, the confessor, who was an Eastern theologian. He he had his he had his hand chopped off and his tongue cut out for protect for writing and trying to defend the trinity in the um in the early days of christianity and he wrote about his contemplation and said similar things to, that you just said about how it's easy for a lot of the practices with yogis and stuff they they claim enlightenment and things like that and they use that as kind of a way to gather a following instead he said that in christianity and the eastern tradition he was more focused on avoiding the accidental slip into that vanity area which can come and i think 
I think, but it, I think it's interesting overall too, just the materialism that's so prevalent. It's such a, a hard effort to even get on the same page when you're discussing with a lot of people, because when I was a really hardcore atheist, there was no thought in my head that there was something unique about the consciousness. And so mm-hmm. consciousness became an enigma to me all of a sudden one time, just on an insight. Um, I just realized, oh, how did all of this material just rearrange itself into something that can perceive itself and other? That makes, you know, it just became such an enigma. And then I and then I ended up doing practicing Hinduism and going to temples with Hinduism and doing a lot of that and then eventually desired something more. So I guess I'm on the consciousness scale. I kind of wanted to ask you, what do you you have a new course? I think I saw on your website, the super super consciousness. And mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you or how do you how do you look at consciousness, mind and and body? Um, I know you make a lot of biblical anatomical comparisons, um, comparing the spinal cord and all of those things. I just kind of wanted to ask when you when you when you hear the word consciousness, what what do you think it is? Is it spirit? Is it a ethereal thing? Or how does one how do you conceptualize it in your model? Um, I when it all boils down, I still have a very abstract view of consciousness. Um, there are so many ways of explaining consciousness, like you just said, from quantum physics to a more biblical understanding of an intelligent spirit presiding over all. Um, and I, I think probably where I'm at at this stage is a marrying of those two understandings. Um, And who knows where I'll be in another five years time, because, you know, like you felt with the Hinduism, I think it's important to realize that we keep learning and the more context that we gain, the deeper our understandings become and the more we have a really concrete, even though nothing's really concrete, understanding of consciousness. Um, To me, energy and consciousness are inextricably combined. You know, you can't have one without the other, whether we're talking about quarks and or protons and electrons as the energy, and we're talking about an, an intelligence as the consciousness part, those two things i just believe nothing can exist without them yeah uh, and that that's the true nature of us that's that consciousness and energy is such a pure form of existence that you know it, it's kind of perfect in that sense yeah so absolutely. when we withdraw and take ourselves into a certain void or certain wilderness state um it helps us to realize our potential and it helps the sacred secretion to raise because there's no expectation and there's no chemical hormones interrupting the process that are induced by the ego getting a wild about what should I be doing at this time and what should I be doing at that time and is it okay to eat this and is my water high vibe enough and should I have this water machine or that water machine like that <laughs> is all that is yeah. noise yeah I got gotcha. you it's It's great. There are things that can help us in that. And, you know, I do seek to have the best water that I can. (laughs) Yeah. However, I wasn't worried about any of that when I first had that experience of pure energy, like rising up through my body and explosive visions going off in my mind while I was wide awake. So I know that that is not the crux of this the material side of it is not the real be all and end all of the practice Mm -hmm. and with the course that's what I hope to try and get across in a sense a lot of people have asked me for a course for a really long time and I was quite reluctant because I don't believe there's a one size fits all and I don't believe that something like this should really be made into a kind of formulaic yeah. thing because yeah. you could access this power through hinduism through kundalini uh through practices of shakti dance 
through Christianity, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that was my route. Um, and everyone that I speak to has a different entry point yeah. into, into the blossoming of their mind and consciousness. Um, so, what? yeah, I guess consciousness for me is really that pure point of potential. I like I like that definition because it leaves enough room to, like you said, for the subjective element to come in and interpret it, but it keeps it grounded in intelligence almost. Like there's this physical intelligence that pulls all the because I because what I came to what I found to be um, rather childlike, but it was very intriguing to me is is that afterwards and in proceeding onward, I began to find unique and intriguing just the most basic elements of being just just the idea that things hold themselves together just to because in science they say okay after the big bang there was this phase where the strong and weak new forces came about and it formed atoms and things but to me it's magic almost it's like what what would hold where's this where is this at and and it truly if you think about it it truly is because just because you call it force doesn't take away from the fact that there's no reason that they should have adhered together to form you there's just no reason that should have happened. If anything, it would have formed something way different than the weirdness of the human experience, I think. <laughs> For sure. I love that. Yeah, I totally resonate with that. Our experience of life is this beautiful, uh, difficult, but easy at times, like, uh, yeah, it's never it's never smooth. It's always got something new and it's never it's never predictable either. It's just like quantum mechanics. I guess they I don't know much about quantum mechanics, but they're always what they say is their lingo is very magical. I mean, they're always talking about things being in two places at once. You know, there's and so if you even as they peer into science, it becomes more it becomes less and less material just by the fact that we can't even tell what anything is when you get down to it. I mean, and so coming from the a militant materialist kind of atheist perspective having that experience you just described with the kundalini type thing that happened is what was what i couldn't justify anymore because i had no i had no um uh, philosophy or no way of being that could incorporate that into it but i knew that it meant something so then i had to go and figure out what it meant and coming back to the bible was just through some experiences like you had there where they were vision experiences are of, of that nature and so it, i was like okay this is the direction to go and then and then came to your videos and saw a unique in, intertwining of the bible and and a lot of those eastern practices and so it was neat to, to neat to see that but i also i guess whenever we talk about um christianity do you see it playing do you see it like kind of a hybridization of all the, of east and west do you see like the doctrine of christianity at the core of your philosophy i know that I know you you use the Bible a lot, but I was just curious on the whole. I, I like the Bhagavad Gita and some of those texts, but I kind of got pulled away from the Hinduism thing because of how it it kind of put reality together in a way that it made it seem like it was trivial or that it was it was nothing. It seemed like the Buddhist philosophies eventually when you got down to it, that everything was suffering. And so you should just retreat back out of the world. And so I was kind of turned off by the Eastern philosophy after a while. But mm -hmm. But I kind of like it too. So I was just curious on how do you merge the two together in your in your practice in your mind, or or how do they link together for you philosophically? Yeah, for me, it's really important to to integrate more than the Christian influence. I have a same the way you described feeling um, about Hinduism and the reduction of the magic in in a sense of the way it's explained. I have a similar feeling to just raw Kundalini practices. Mm -hmm. um, I have a wonderful Kundalini teacher locally to me, thankfully, who integrates a lot of music and different aspects into the practice so that makes it really cool yeah. but when I've been to um what I would say purist kundalini um, retreats or classes and it's like we are now going to do the breath of fire for 120 seconds and you know you sit there panting like a dog it's I mean no I shouldn't laugh because I don't mean any disrespect no, to anybody else's way that works for them 
Um, and this is what I mean by we're all so different that there's going to be different ways, yeah. different things that feel great for us. But for me, I'm a very touchy feely person and I like to be thinking of I guess I love Christianity still and the Bible still in a sense that it's quite poetic to me. Mm -hmm. And even if you take a lot of the stories on a literal level, you can still find um, a nice moral or a nice takeaway. And I think it works as a good foundation um, for children even. Um, but I would also never go back to not knowing or not having experienced um, the texts and practices of other cultures. I think Hinduism is um, beautiful in so, so many ways. Um, the way that the gods are described and um their different characteristics and you know how they can almost be um brought in a bit like a totem of like a south american tradition to kind of help you through i mean there's science in in that yeah. although it seems so abstract the yeah. science of those visualizations and the knowing that there's someone there with you helping you um even as a fairy tale is it, it works yes. you know no yeah absolutely i know i i uh i like that description just because i i had a real i had a real um intense attraction to the to the figure of krishna and arjuna these two characters that are in the bhagavad gita they carry out dialogue and it's one of the oldest texts in the world and so i know exactly what you mean about it's irreplaceable wisdom um, of some type that's that's put out there in the, one of the oldest languages. So you're really getting, you know, regardless of what it is related to, it's it's giving you truth. It has to. It's objective because it's so old and it's survived for so long um, that it, it it inevitably plays some kind of part in the formation of of a, of a good conception of consciousness. I have to assume. Um, what I what I also enjoy about your concept, what we you talk about light um frequently and i i came to the same conclusion about the nature of light and in the bible it does say in the book of john you know it says god is light and then it, you know and so it makes me think light and then now in like science they've even been able to take photons and make matter out of them actual physical matter they've turned it into positrons and stuff like that and so if you can take photons which are supposedly the building blocks of light and actually create the building blocks of a desk or of anything then what I mean, inevitably, the God being light and God, you know, and everything being in that light is a everybody's been looking into light forever and nobody still knows what it is. And so uh, people really, truly don't seem to have an idea. I mean, they've looked into it forever, but really nobody gets it. And it's one of the phenomena like electricity where it just it's such an enigma because without it, nothing, you can't see anything. And somehow the brain can use light to just build the reality. Cause that's all it has is like photons to assemble this like 3d printer reality. You know, it's kind of what it's doing. It's 3d printing out based on the lights. So I kind of wanted to see, I know it's a broad question, but I just wanted to ask you about that, um, about light and what you see role that plays in the sake and your thought. I think everything that we can see and touch, like you said, has its parallel in the light realm. Um, almost like when you're watching a TV program and you see someone conjuring something up and first you see like tiny particles of light and then you see it it taking form. I don't think that's far from the reality of it if we could see it, if it wasn't invisible. And in some of the visual um, experiences that I've had through the sacred secretion, um, I've seen light as a sort of wave that wants to basically be it, it's it's almost though it's as though it's in servitude to 
to you um and you have this responsibility to to use your light and use it well um i do believe that god is light as the bible says because when we go to the smallest um forms of matter that we can and beyond like you said we come to to photons which is essentially le electromagnetic energy um and you know that tiny part of the spectrum of light that we can actually see um with the rainbow but light is so much more mm -hmm. than than that part that we can actually appreciate with our eyes that always intrigues me and I find it just so wonderful and fascinating to know that beyond that tiny fraction there's there's so much more to behold and when I think about the light body that 144,000 that we were speaking of at the beginning I think of our chromosomes and how the word chromo means color and somes comes from soma and I mean I did a video specifically about soma which is essentially water or plasma if you like that births all life forms so when you think about water or plasma and color mm -hmm. chroma which is essentially light because of that tiny part of the light that we can see I think our chromosomes are the manifestation the first manifestation of our light bodies uh -huh. and then, then it's really interesting that those things as you know the likes of Bruce Lipton and yes. um, Joe Dispenza and people like that are now proving that our our chromosomes um, respond to our thought and emotions so we really are able to align with the God in us and um, use our light really well to share goodness and love out there. Yeah, that was that was poetically said. Um, I think I think like it says in the Bible, it says nobody nobody lights a lamp and sticks it under the table. They all they buy a lampstand and they put the lamp on it. And that's kind of what you're saying is, yeah, you're not going to you're not going to buy a lamp and stick it underneath your table and just let it light up a little area. You're supposed to put it on. You're, you have a table specifically for it and and you make that place known. And I think what you what you're what you kind of answer with that thought is is the, the kind of confusing aspect of the Bible that says the kingdom of God is within you, which is a part in the Gospel of Luke. And it's of course, it's a beautiful statement and it makes sense as you as you mature and go through it and, and experience life it becomes more real but a lot of people and not a lot of people i don't want to externalize it but myself i guess i mean over time have come to realize that i just never read it right i never looked at the it was like a rereading was needed of this text um to get the understanding that was needed and i found myself to orthodox christianity which was which is a, a really unique Eastern hybrid tradition that almost has this based on mystagogy and based on like mysticism that incorporates quite a bit of this thought. But I wanted to go back to what you said about the chromosomes is um, there's a gentleman that I spoke with who named Dr. Michael Levin, and he has been doing research on what makes a, the body and different organisms shape the way they are. What's the morphology and the driving factor behind the, what causes it to be an arm instead of a leg? You know, what causes it to stop develop? Because people don't often think that just because you have a DNA sequence doesn't mean all that tells you is how to build a protein. It doesn't tell you what to form it into, what image to make it into. And so he has actually discovered basically the mechanism behind it, which is an electrical field that configures the morphology of the body. And he can edit that electrical uh, gradients and it shifts the way the body is formed. And so I think it pays a lot of credence to what you what your insights are is that there is some kind of connection that is forming the body and the organism as per its image that it was created in. Otherwise, it would just be DNA just translated into proteins with no organization. So I think that That's pays a lot of homage to your your um, thought for sure. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to look that up. I'll send you, I'll send you a couple so of videos cool. of him. He did a TED talk where he does a really it's he calls it the electric face because it even has 
like a like a at the beginning of the zygote whenever it's just a dot like two cells it has a outline of a face and actually it is the actual gradient that forms the actual face and so it made me think of immediately of before i formed you in the womb i knew you and it was like there's the face before you had and there's this zen koan that i used to do when i would meditate which is called like what what was your face before it was a face or something like that they they like to pair paradoxes together to produce insights yeah. and so i was like oh there that's that's that and the bible says that and i was like that's it so i with this gentleman's work i think he is progressing so much in the way of the hard science and then your insights just seem to pair real nicely with that ideology love that because i've been looking a lot into stem cells and with the cell of life book yeah um my stem cell research was a really important part of that specific book. And it was really funny because I actually had an accident where I hurt my arm and it just wasn't healing through all of, you know, my meditations and taking my anti-inflammatories and doing my stretches and strength work and all of these things. And in the end, um, I went to a private doctor who um, suggested that I had stem cell therapy. And as um, when I went for the procedure, I was just so fascinated by what was going to happen. He took a sample of my blood from one arm, put it in a machine that spun it with, I guess, some kind of magnetic centrifugal thing. Mm -hmm. um, that separated the layers of the blood and then he skimmed off um, the part where the, the stem cells are and yeah. injected it into my other arm where the injury was. And I'm not joking, within like a few weeks, the pain was completely gone and I was back to my yoga practice at nor as normal. So I found it just incredible that it really validated my research but also when I was talking to the doctor and it turned out that he had his own books and published papers huh? that are specifically about stem cells he um I said so how did but how do the cells know that they're going into my elbow yeah. and that they're going to make elbow cells mm -hmm. if it's just coming from my blood yeah um and he said, well, if I injected it into your kidney, it would become kidney cells. If I injected it into, you know, wherever, Wild. it would adapt by its environment and become exactly what it needs to be. And I was just like, oh, yeah. the intelligence of creation is just absolutely awesome. I mean, I can't it ever is incredible. get it. Yeah. give enough credit to what we are living and experiencing it is so it is it is incredible that i i had never heard in it anybody's personal experience with stem cells before i hear it often um in sports they use it for athletes and stuff but i never i'd never heard a first-hand account of it um being that useful i'm glad that that's really cool though that's all, and that's nice too to be able to get finally get that healed obviously but uh the it's it's kind of interesting just i guess kind of like what what the gentleman I was talking about Dr. Levin he he's working on that he's making efforts in that direction there's another direction that seems to be uniquely tied to your work that, that I've talked to um Dr. Diego his name is Dr. Diego Borges and he's he's put a lot of time and effort into formulating epigenetics and coming out coming up with he's made a program that sequenced the chromosome and the DNA and used it basically to show its morphology but it's still it doesn't have um, a way to tell it what to form as an image, you know, and then so it's this electrical gradient mixed with. So basically those two guys, but specifically the epigenetic thing, which is where basically epigenetics, I think, is the process of of genes turning on or off and environment and experience and um, all that can actually activate an unused part of the genome at some point. So say you have a piece of you have a bunch of DNA and they used to call it junk DNA is what it was literally called in science. And they thought it was just evolution had just put in a bunch of garbage. And then it turns out we're seeing now that that these these genes are triggered to turn on and off at different periods of people's lives. And when that happens, anatomical changes can occur. People's faces can become to look different. 
um, there's different things that it affects for the physiology and the anatomy of the body. And you seem to have a very beautiful pairing of anatomy of the human versus the cosmos, kind of a a microcosm of the macrocosm sort of experience. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the epigenetic part of it where you you have the sacred secretion and all of that. What I guess what I was going to ask is how do you, do you see the human the human person as an embodiment of what the cosmos kind of thing if that makes any sense like a dualistic approach or is it more to you like monistic one is the same as the other um, it's a hard question it's kind of a badly formulated too no that is a great question and it's a question that um, I ask myself actually. Um, I think that it's all in tandem, all the layers, Um, you know, from the atom where you have, you know, the the electron, the proton, the neutron in that trinity um, to within our brain, you have the trinity of the pineal, the pituitary Mm -hmm. and the optimus. Um, the sun, the moon, and the earth, I guess, um, in, you know, the outside kind of world, as it were. Um, I believe that those layers are all, you know, in tandem with one another, maybe not completely in sync timing-wise, but I do believe that we are supposed to be able to make those parallels and appreciate them um, in the as so within is without as above so below, even though a lot of people think that is a very satanic statement. Um, It's it's very apparent um, when we start breaking down the, the physical and uh, invisible nature of creation yeah so uh, which part comes first um well the light is present throughout all of those layers yeah. and the intelligence is in the light so intelligence presiding pervading throughout all of that yeah yeah i like that i like the intelligence sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you um no, it's uh, fine. I, I, I like i like the use of the word intelligence because it seems like in the trinity they use the word they are the in in the gospel of john it says god the word was god the word was with god um in the beginning was the word and it was god and it was with god and it's like the word actually translates back to the logos which is the greek word that nobody really it's really not it's really an ambiguous statement it's more than the word and so it recently it made me this hair that had this harebrained insight that may or may not be completely bonkers is the trinitarian approach to language is that whenever you pair like a, a subject and a predicate and a verb you get something called a sentence but the sentence depends upon the subject object and the verb to all exist first in order for the word to be made so i started thinking how does a like if you build a car and you're assembling all the parts of the car, when at what point does it become a car? And if it does, did the, did the word car exist prior to assembling of those parts? If, if so, yeah. then that requires a predetermined method of a certain form to have existed prior to the assembly of it. And the word, do you just make it up? It had to still – so I don't know how – um I don't know if that thought it's is completely funny. and utterly bonkers, but it seems to me like the Trinity is like when you pair the right three things in the right order, you get a fourth thing, which is tra- like the center – the transcendent element of everything you pair all the right parts you get a car the car is actually not really a real thing it's just a word used to describe the proper pairing of all of these elements or something like that and it's like creation it's like magic i totally resonate with what you're saying i find it really smart and really interesting it's funny that you use the analogy of a car as well because i can't tell you how long i got stuck on those three letters when I was looking at carbon and car the car of Osiris and then you have the car the K-A-R as opposed to the C-A-R and all of the connotations that that involves and language is really like 
you know, you could spend an entire lifetime just working with language and etymology. And, you know, the forming of sentences is absolutely fascinating. And I think when we go back to those layers um, and that scripture in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, um, there's so many beautiful ways that that can be taken because even if we think about vibration as word or sound in its you know in the tones that we can't usually hear Mm -hmm. becoming a force that um invigorates the light um there and i don't know if you've seen the studies of sonoluminescence i haven't no sound so in so so sono luminescent studies it explains how sound affects light and ignites it in some certain oh wow circumstances so you know that scripture can also be taken as you know maybe it's just vibration in general as in sound yeah that's I like that. I've have you ever this is an oddball question relating to that, however. Have you ever in yoga, yoga practice or meditation had a feeling where you could feel sound? Where the like when yeah. somebody spoke. Okay, so I've had that's I've had that go on when I do when I do like non-dual practices meditation. Like I, I'll do a lot of guided ones sometimes that are like Advaita Vedanta uh, style you know, meditations where they they they're at real um they kind of dissolve the self, so to speak. They're like ego killing machine. Like it, it really, if you practice it hardcore enough, it or not hardcore, but if you practice it as per the religious order that would practice it by an, a regular adherent of the custom, you would arrive at a conclusion that the self is basically an illusion. And in doing so, that practice makes you, it almost makes all the senses create like this di- di- like very diverse synesthesia where almost all the sensory data becomes one, where feeling, touch, sight it almost feels as if that is uniquely a single organism or a single thing that split came mm. from a unity multiplicity from unity like there's this sense data and then there's intellect or there's sense data and the soul but somehow the human experience is a combination of there was sense data and there was the idea of intelligence and somehow somebody was you know god was like oh i need to put this into a figure in my image and it can act out my custom and unfortunately it might get too attracted to material as opposed to the realm of it, the unseen. And so that might've been the story of the fall of, of humanity and in the Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition, it's very similar to what you're saying. They have this, it's, I think you would enjoy, I don't know how much you've looked at, but I think you would really like um, a lot of the writings from some of those Eastern theologians because they, they did a beautiful job of, of saving the, the condition of man, which this question dragged on too long. Cause I was, but I was thinking, Christianity always looked at the human condition as a fallen, doomed, they had to be punished, you know, and all of these things. And then I came to the conclusion that, oh, the Orthodox Christians look at it completely different. They don't look at it like that. They don't look at the human condition in such a negative fashion, and they don't see Christ as a figure that had to be punished instead of us. They see him as a redeeming person who voluntarily shouldered our burdens. And so I found it interesting through that lens. But anyways, uh, the whole the whole meditation and feeling thing um did that that's kind of an odd phenomena that occurs and i just wanted to bring that up but that's interesting to know at least it's happened to you is it um like a clear audio experience do you hear actual words or is it more like tones it's like if it's like whenever it um, if i'm in a meditation meditative state and it gets really like really um peaceful if any abrupt noise happens around me in the environment it's like it impacts my body like it's, I can hear it with my ears, but I can feel on my body the actual, the actual sound somehow. And I've, wow. and I can't figure out what it is or how it happens. And I don't know if that's like a thing that happens to people or if maybe it's I'm misinterpreting it. I think it's part and parcel of the the sacred secretion and you know the building and tuning of the light body. Um, what one of the books that I've I keep finding myself going back to is Thinking and Destiny by Harold Percival. And when he talks about us building or tuning our light bodies, he almost puts it across 
in a way that makes it seem easy to dismiss um like and you know how do you think you get this body yeah. that's ready for you when you leave this physical vehicle or car that you're in right now you know you you're building for the future of your light body leaving your skin and bones yeah as as wild as that sounds i find it fascinating yeah. that there's this sense of us um building and tuning our a stronger soul or spirit if you like so that when we do separate from our, our skin and bones vehicle um we can I don't know maybe there's different levels that we can uh-huh. break through to in consciousness based on how far we've come in that inner work yeah yeah I I think it's kind of like the perspective of theosis which is in 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 I keep bringing it back to Christianity. I don't, I don't mean that's just, that's just because that's my primary focal point, but I mean, this is relatable to all customs. I mean, not all, but a lot. Um, I think you're right that there's like a level tiered kind of structure that's hierarchical in in nature, which is what I think kind of about language too, is that there's this pyramidal structure that is arranged and that ultimately it's hierarchical, no matter what you, no matter what you prefer about hierarchies, it seems there is a subservience of everything to something else. And if you don't recognize that, then you become subservient to something that you have that you do not want to be subservient to. So it's like, if you don't put the right thing at the top, then the next, the next social issue or the next, whatever will become that top of the pyramid. And so you, you're inevitably drawn to formulate your own hierarchy of value. And if you formulate it and you feel like, Oh, just dismiss the fact that values are there's it's all material. So value doesn't actually exist. Well, then you end up valuing really weird things. At least I did. I mean, all kinds of things would become my number one focal point for my attention. And so I realized, oh, the human person is naturally angled towards a hierarchy. Like when you get up and move or you get up and go do something, you're ultimately valuing something over something else. You're not you're going to this store to do this because it's more valuable to get this than it is to go over there. And so it seems like to me there's this hierarchy. And I think that probably extrapolates outwardly to like where you kind of slowly progress and divinize, I guess you would say, mm-hmm. where you where you kind of occupy more because that the Orthodox Christianity proposes that the nature of God is an essence and an energy, and that his energies are are you can relate to. And their doctrine of theosis is not one that you're used to hearing in Christianity about salvation. It's more of a a slow progression over time to become divinized. Um and theosis is the process of making that occur. And they speak on the they actually have some theologians that have written on similar things like the sacred secretion, but not using that language and stuff. And I was going to another, another personal experience. If you don't mind, I ask you about just because um, I guess my, as I started doing all this meditation there, does the sake, does that sacred secretion sometimes manifest physically like an actual liquid? <laughs> and I just asked that question because will it put oil on your, will it like people have oil on their face and stuff like that on accident, not on accident, but will it do that sometimes? Yeah, 100%. Um, There are lots of mentions of physical oil in the Essene um, Bible, um, the Holy Megillah. It took a long time for me to translate exactly what it was describing, Um, but it is that multiplying and seeping over of CSF. When that happens in... um, the most extreme end of the the spectrum of that the expansion of that oil um due to the faux being agents which are those incredible biochemicals um that are talked about a lot in these practices um it it can actually like escape out of the uh, uh arachnoid space and through your skin and and leave you feeling extremely oily um it's so odd and, mm. it's just an odd it's an odd phenomena um i didn't know there was any doctrine on it i'm just curious if that was um and it it just seems in the bible there's a lot of mentions to oil um mm. and i've actually i don't i actually saw some a gentleman who was doing some like a he's a neuroscientist of some sort and he was 
doing an basically a presentation on cerebrospinal fluid being the the agent by which consciousness is pervade which is of course what your i mean if your videos are extremely detailed and they're i mean the, the amount of work you put into those there's i'm definitely glad that you shared it decided to share it because it's become something that's following it it was kind of just really unique and i'm really happy to see you making videos again because of of, of all the unique connections but i had then i had seen this gentleman and he was scientifically thinking csf was the the agent by which we actually connect to the 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 actual consciousness and so the and it's a weird fluid it, it's kind of odd it's forgotten about and it's kind of in the background but it's such an odd substance and out of all the fluids in the body csf seems to have some kind of odd nature to it for sure and it plays mm -hmm. a role you think as well i guess in in the reviving of the human person i guess kind of like a resurrection of the psyche sort of when it raises is that kind of how you see it a hundred percent to me i have no doubt that the cerebrospinal fluid which is known to be oily and salty is the uh, christ oil um in the sense that you know a candle needs wax to to be a light and a car needs oil oh, wow. to run. um our bodies need this oil to have as the the oil of consciousness so you've got the the light and uh the energy and the consciousness you know forming the light and coming in and the oil is the vehicle or the uh -huh. manifestation of those things and um when you go back into much much older versions like 200 year i have a version of the gray's anatomy that's 200 years old and they were actually speaking about the lymph system and um the cerebrospinal fluid system and they they weren't differentiated back then it was an overall understanding of the fluid body and how all of our cells have to be born in this fluid yeah. water or oil um so yeah for me it's highly affirmed that the csf is you know this phenomenal compound much like you know when we look at um traditional kind of evolution studies and how all of this life came out of the ocean because it you know it's that salty mineral um consistency mm -hmm. we, we're birthing cells in the same way and our dna spiral is actually caused by the movement of that water and how the minerals actually have to coagulate in order to be born so when we think about the book of revelations for example and serpents rising out of the water it's like well of course in those days they didn't have scientific um, terminology to describe they were the things that they were seeing in their in their visions so a lot of things do sound very mythological and and fairy tale like but then also you know some would argue that that's a deliberate attempt to hide it and veil it behind symbols yeah. maybe it's a bit of both yeah maybe some of some of it's quite innocent and some of it is like oh no we literally can't let the people have this yeah yeah it could be yeah you're right there's probably it's not one or the other fully it's not this this hiding of the gnosis of the of the people but it's also it's interesting because like you said the nature of sharing any of this stuff is is you know they it's it's quick to be criticized as heresy by a lot of people who are very very vigorously religious and it's unfortunate to me that that is the case because it's not at all it's actually less egotistical it's less self-centered it's less self-conscious a view that incorporates this type of knowledge and it's not to put some to put myself or anything like that on an ivory tower it's to put myself much much like a child and and to look back at the world like it's animated and to reanimate that that perspective that used to exist when idealism dominated the world because people 500 years ago used to think it was no weird thing to them to, to to portray in a story the nature of a plant talking 
or an animal speaking. It's because they had a more animated, lively universe. They had a they had this bi- like bi-directional interaction with what was being interacted with and the interacting agent. And it seems like there was this complete dissolving of of idealism just changed into dualism where there was a spirit and a mind, a mind and a body. Now it's just like there's just matter. And if you put matter together the right way, there you got a bait. You got a you have a child or you have a and that's what I think is so unique about creation and procreation is the difference between the word create and begat is unique to look at because when you think of like if you create a statue, let's say you make a statue of David, like the one that um was where I don't know where it's at or who or who carved it, but I know it exists. And uh and if you you're kind of creating that, but begatting is like creating a brand new thing from two. So if you bring a male and a female together and you create a brand new child, that is insane to me. I mean, I started thinking about it and I started realizing there's no possible way that works unless there's magic. Because it really, I mean, it's a beautiful thing to create a just like I mean, I know you mentioned um you I mean, I think you mentioned to me in your email originally that you you might you have a child and I think or you had mm-hmm. child care to say and I, that made me I like I like the I like children because they don't they're so they seem to be closer to these this knowledge than anybody else, almost in a weird mm-hmm. way. They just can't verbalize it, um, obviously. But they're they're there, they're right there at it. And they, it's like the only way they'll ever leave it is if somebody le- brings them away. If somebody says, No, that's not right, and then they're directed elsewhere. And so I kind of the main thing I wanted to ask you is is about that. Did has having a child, um, it seems to me like that changes people's perspective on the world a lot. And I know it's kind of a personal question. I just wanted to ask if you don't mind, how is that, how did that experience change your because I've asked this to a few people because I'm always interested because I think it's such a unique thing to create a child. And so I think it has impacts on people that people people describe that experience sometimes as like a transcendent experience that wakes them up to the reality of what really matters. And so I was just curious on on your on on how you view that like and it says in the bible make yourself of a, like a child and all that and it and everything mm. and i think i keep trying to find a mission to go after with my passions and i always think well it's it needs to be something that helps children obviously because that's really the only thing that needs that matters if you think about it, it's like you're we're going to be gone bodies but there's going to be all these kids that are going to be suffering and so it's like well that's really the most matter the most thing that matters the most i guess i would love to do something that can um help to introduce these ideas to to children and makes it really accessible for them as well. Um, I've thought about it for a long time. Time hasn't really permitted yet, but I definitely think that that is on the path at some point because, like you said, children are our future. And I think we're in a beautiful time now, whereas maybe in my generation, um, a lot of parents were still very stern and there was still a feeling of um, tough love and this sort of thing. And, you know, I I know quite a lot of um, people my age who have some quite traumatic stories to tell. And, you know, my, my own childhood wasn't without its uh, challenges. And, in some ways, I think that's great because it really develops our spirit and makes us really scrappy and want to get to the bottom of like, how can I make this better? Yeah. Um, and on the other hand, I'm glad that we're in a much more nurturing um, phase of of life and evolution in that since I've had my son um all of the you know the experts who have come in along the way whether it was at prenatal classes or toddler groups um talking about doing as much as you can of their upbringing to be led by them Uh as opposed to you just forcing your um ways on them I mean that's a very different approach to the way that I was brought up so who knows what the outcome of that will be I guess we'll find out in like the next 30 40 years but um as to how being mum changed my life yeah I mean profound wild absolutely wild on me right, sorry oh, yeah. about that. Okay. Um, I was listening to you I'm sorry no no don't worry 
yeah, I'm so grateful for my son's presence in my life. Um, from the moment I was pregnant, even mm-hmm. I I felt like it changed me. Um, That's neat. That's so neat. A phenomena. It, it it really truly is. It's just like something that wasn't even in existence before. It's brand new and it's so uniquely unique to itself. I guess just the act of creating. It's like begatting. That's what I was thinking. It's like when he's when it says like the son, you know, God begat Jesus. It's he created him out of a an amalgamation of something that was existing. The Trinity itself interacted with itself to produce the product of its own cognition or its own contemplation or its own intelligence, like the logos, the word, the intelligence, the thread of logic or coherence that's that kind of works in the way of forming perception and intelligence. Because when you look at the world, it's like I see this computer here and all of that, but how? Why do I? How can I? How can it possibly be that the universe is at all coherent? and intelligible to perception by humans how can you know it seems to me that there's a there's a dichotomy or not a dichotomy it's it's like monistic in the sense that it's all it's all one and one in itself in the same essence but um they're connected in a way that makes them intelligible and interacting and it seems like begatting something was like creating you begat a child it's not like you're carving a statue of a child that's creating but begatting something is like putting two things together with the right third thing and then you get this brand new thing and that's only possible alchemically almost. And you see like people like Sir Isaac Newton, who spent most of their life devoted to alchemy studies, to the study of alchemy. And he even said when he, you know, towards the end of his life that he's like, he had 4,000 something books on alchemy was, well, he invented calculus and saw his endeavors into alchemy as superior to the calculus. I mean, that was, that was like an accident. He's like, yeah, I finished calculus, but I'm more, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go do this now. He's like, you guys can have that knowledge. That's useless anyways. He's like the real stuff's over here. And so it's not, it's not too, it's not, it's kind of annoying because people look at it. It's like you say alchemy and they think you're crazy and, and all of this. And it's like, if it's, it's, it just frustrates me a little bit that it's like so hard to have these dialogues at, with, and I think work like you're doing is making it much more approachable. People are seeing it, it's been more exposed, but I think there's something I know what you mean though you like about it. when I go on the school run I, like you know and I'm standing in the playground watching you know my son walk into school we're generally talking about you know when do we need to buy another pair of school shoes or what football club is happening on the weekend we're not talking about alchemy and cosmology and theosophy and all of these wonderful things um and it is a shame that you know maybe we can't have um deeper more enriching conversations with more people in our lives but I definitely think we're going in the right direction and I think the more people find their voice and share their own individual take on things the more it will um inspire um others to also do the same thing because no two perspectives are identical yeah so there might be one person who could glean so much from my interpretation and perspective and another person that it won't resonate with at all but they could go to someone else who's just putting it across in a slightly different way and take so much more away so I think the more voices that chime in to this awesome conversation and i i see it growing i think with the birth of tiktok and the growth of instagram and youtube and all these things um that there and especially um tiktok actually i know i don't someone told me that that word gets like picked up by certain sensors or whatever but tiktok i yeah oh really huh yeah no idea if that's true apparently youtube picks it up um but i think that the um their algorithms and the way that videos can catch on fire on that platform is really interesting and i think it's the sen- the levels of censorship are so different to the other bigger platforms that have been around for longer and that really excites me because i see more and more people talking about things that to me 
are more important and more enriching for us and the future of human life yeah, than definitely. just what you know is happening with materialism and you know the latest like high street trend yeah that's a great point it's almost like the internet was the second Revo gutenberg revolution kind of like when the pr printing press was invented it was a mod it was a marvel i mean the fact that what it what it did to the spread of ideas like i mean it's like wildfire once you can start printing a book and taking these codexes of compiled scri that scribes have to sit there and etch out copies of and then you all of a sudden have this invention this new thing um the the print printing press and now everybody can have books the consequences of that are amazing um it's like a wildfire across the entire once you could start trans transmitting lang language and ideas and text over long distances and putting them in the hands of people things just rapidly evolve and and I think you're spot on that like this this utilization of technology in such a way that it can promote social contagions like that so quickly. And contagion mm -hmm. has like this weird connotation with it, but it's not a negative word. A contagion is just something that goes and, you know, spreads quickly and then takes over. It usually is thought of as like a virus, something bad. But in this case, it's like that word, isn't it? It's like it's gone viral. But I just yeah, see viral, it as, yeah. as, as it's common ground. We're able to recognize all of our common ground because we have these incredible tools that reach people on the other side of the world that go, oh, that resonates with me. Share that because I know these other people that will resonate with. Yeah. And you've got the marrying of all these ideas just popping off left, right and center. And it's flipping stunning. It, it really is. And I think your contribution to that effort is uh, it's really uh, something something that I have really respected for a long time. It's meant a lot to me because it's connected so many, every time, whenever you're on a journey of trying to connect insights that are all so far outside of your ability, because I don't have my, you know, looking at myself, I try to minimize, I mean, any, there's a quote from, I think it's Charles Spurgeon, a theologian. He said, any theology, any system of theology that magnifies man is you, you should turn away from because there's no magnification of the human being over the other ever. And if that's the theology you're using, that's what Protestantism is in in America. People have no clue what they're doing. I mean, I'm not trying to be rude and call people out. I'm saying this is an important critical issue that has to be rectified because the Christianity does not exist anymore like it should in the U.S. And people claim it and they don't expose. And me, I'm the first one to claim it and not act like I should. But I'm saying there has to be a note of a realization of the person to know they're falling short of what they could actually be. That's what I and that's mm -hmm. a that's not a realization of pride. It's a realization of the that you need to destroy pride. And then continually recognize what that you're a subservient to something, some intelligence that has formed you. And it's like kind of like not saying thank you. It's like people, you know, people who say thank you, people who don't. It's it might be a small gesture, but it's seriously say thank you to the, the ability that you woke up this morning and, and just back to the basics and and all of that. And but anyways, that all aside, I just I know it's I know it's uh, getting late over there. I just wanted to say um, thank you a lot for joining me. And it's been interesting conversing with you because it, it always does when I talk with people, it goes down different avenues. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk with me. Oh, I'm, I'm so flattered for you to say that. And I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to meet you and talk to you as well. And I think your channel's awesome. I watched um, a couple of your interviews and I'm just like really humbled that there's just so many amazing souls out there doing such great work in sharing and and bringing people together and you know you speak about gratitude that is one of the highest um, frequency words that we have and I think that it's really important and when we think about um, God as parents you know in Christianity it's always like you know the loving father is funny because you know what when your kid doesn't say thank you to you and you've gone out of your way to do something really cool for them you're like it's really disheartening because you're like oh my gosh I thought they were going to think that was so awesome I can't believe that they don't even seem bothered yeah. so it's really funny because it's like oh I wonder if you know God could also be feeling that way when we forget to be thankful for all of our gifts. So, excellent point. It's almost like God Himself possesses a phenomenology that might just be itself something about intellect and and feeling, 
And because obviously mm. he's portrayed as having like emotions in the Bible, like jealousy and all this. And people think that's like a rather crude description of um, a deity in the sky. And, and, and to say that is ridiculous because to think about what jealousy really is, is it's this deep inner subjective contortion of consciousness. It's this radical shift of your ability to act properly. Because if you get overly jealous, for some reason, you may go and act out something you have no desire to do. So then now you're doing what you don't even want to do. You're doing what jealousy for you became a slave and subservient to the feeling. So feeling is above matter because matter can't make you do anything. But pain can make you run away. Pain can make you cut your own arm off while it's trapped under a rock like that. That person that wrote that book who sawed his own arm off. I mean, because mm -hmm. he was stuck there. People will do absolutely incredible things because it's like the most real thing is actually pain. And love is the only thing that defeats it. It seems to me like. And so to say God's jealous and then to recharacterize that as some kind of unintelligent way of describing the, um, a deity, it's like, first of all, it's not really a deity. And second of all, it might be the way to describe God is a phenomenology plus intellect and then a spirit that conveys that it, something to receive that intellect, something to just transmit it, and then the intellect itself and all of that kind of in a triune relationship. But I I think that that there needs to be a little bit more of an emphasis on, on subjective feeling because it, cause with materialism – They've tried to treat everything as if it's an imbalance of neurotransmitters and correct it with all these medications. And that may be needed, but of course, I have no clue what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not educated on this. I just see it, and it seems to me odd that, hey, maybe there's a problem. Maybe there's a problem that's not tethered to the physical representation of it. It might not be these invisible particles you think you can see that might be in a lower amount of – you know, it just seems um, like – these more esoteric views like you present and everything are helping probably this this ideas and everything at least come back a little bit to the animated world that that actually we are a part of and so um i'm i'm excited to get re start reading your books and all that and uh i think it's so neat uh it's hard to write a book it really is hard and so to have written books like that that's a really cool achievement i've i've been trying for like a year and a half to piece the, all these insights together and it's so difficult and so I think that anybody that gets a book written, it to me is a miracle. <laughs> and so I think that it, because it is an endeavor that is so difficult. And I think it, it takes people like really inspired people to do it. And so I just wanted to say that once, once more that I, I didn't want to keep you too much longer, but I really appreciate all your efforts and your time with me. And I look forward to hopefully chatting again in the future. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'll let you go now, Kelly. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate Thank you. it. Yes, ma'am. You Take have a good care. rest of your night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.